Whoa, 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 whoa. Welcome back to another episode of KIO with your hosts, Vince, aka Crypto Noah, and JT, aka J Mansion. Now that we're done with all the bullshit, so <laughs> no. what's up, guys? I know it's been a while, but we are back with another book review. In this video, we're going to be reviewing The Change in World Order by Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio is a gentleman. He is. You call him a gentleman, gentleman, bro. That is funny. I can catch that, bro. Ray Dalio is the chief investment officer and co-founder or founder of one of the largest hedge funds in the world, if not the largest, in Bridgewater Associates. Okay. Uh, at the beginning of the year last year, I think they were managing like over a hundred one hundred and one billion, if I remember correctly. They managed money for sovereign wealth funds, central banks, and pretty much large financial institutions. And Ray Dalio, has, he's written a few books. He's written Principles. He's written Principles for Navigating Big Debt Crises, which we're going to review in the near future. And then today, like I said, we're going to be reviewing the changing world order. Now, before we start, I'm going to give my best Ray Dalio impersonation. So when you go to buy bonds, actually, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not good at his. Did you want uh, to <laughs> So when you go when you go to buy bond, he's actually a hard guy at first. That's what I'm saying. I thought it would be easy. But we could do Joe Biden. What's up, folks? Welcome to America. This is I Brazil. America. I'm do everything in uh, his best interest. Say so, no. That's what I'm funny, going bald. I fall off bikes. He was in a he was in an interview with or a commercial with Barack Obama. Barack Obama read the whole script. This fool said, It's very, very important, folks. And that's all he said. I'm like, yeah, that's your only line. You the actual president. <laughs> I always take notes on all the books that I read so that the most important things are easily accessible. So I don't have to reread the book. So we're gonna read off the points. We got about a page and a quarter. So we're gonna read these off and we're going to elaborate on what is not self-explanatory, which is pretty much most of it. Those societies that draw on the widest range of people and give them responsibilities based on their merits rather than privileges are the most sustainably successful because one, they find the best talent to do their jobs well, and two, they have diversity of perspectives, and three, they are perceived as the fairest, which fosters social stability. When I hear this, I just think of the American dream. It's like we have this democracy where people want to come over here and like start a business or work a job. You know, you hear about have a white picket fence and the family, da 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 da. I think this is like the biggest middle class society ever maybe and then you look at a country like china where it's communism and people don't have as much freedom and while china is like a financial powerhouse because they make a lot of things that the world use they are extremely strict and you don't really hear about people saying like oh i want to move to china but you always hear about people wanting to come to america because of these things i feel like yeah. this is pretty basic what you think 100 percent an environment like that is how you basically let division of labor take over inside of your economy and going to China. They actually lack division of labor, which is why part of the reason uh, what 85 percent of what they produce is manufactured. We're not that much better. We're, we've moved towards a service based economy, so we're not really even producing goods for the most part either. But it wasn't always that way in America. And because of globalization, it allowed division of labor to take over on a larger scale. And because China has inoculated themselves from the rest of the world, obviously they've been the manufacturing hub and they pretty much, I'm pretty sure like they would probably, they have trainings for manufacturing. That's how heavily weighted manufacturing is, is in terms of China's economy. All right. So let's move on to the next point. It says having a reserve currency is great while it lasts because it gives a country exceptional borrowing and spending power plus significant power over who else in the world gets the money and credit needed to buy and sell internationally. However, having a reserve currency typically sows the seeds of a country seeding to be a reserve currency country. That's because it allows the country to borrow more than it could otherwise afford to borrow and the creation of lots of money and credit to service the debt debases the value of the currency and causes the loss of its status as a reserve currency. When countries desperately need reserve currencies to service their reserve currency, denominated debts, and to buy things from sellers who only accept reserve currencies, they can go bankrupt. You know, this reminds me of that quote. 
a nation is born stoic but dies epicurean you know and then you hear about it's kind of the same thing as uh strong men create good times good times create weak men weak men create hard times and it's just a cycle and this is why you know you look at there's never been a fiat currency that's lasted you know they always end up falling because you know they start off being backed by gold or some hard asset that never works because you need to be able to extend credit right and create money so that you can pay people to build your society so it's like too much credit is bad but also not enough credit is way worse because that in that case you have a third world country but people get greedy no one's perfect and they always end up printing way more money than they have backed people come they figure it out it's a run on the banks and then eventually the country starts to decline and then also when you think about how they're printing all this money and a lot of times it doesn't go into productive means like maybe people buying like expensive art or luxury items and they're not putting that money back into the economy you know these are all things that make a nation and a currency uh end up collapsing essentially and we're kind of on that path here in america but it's a little different just because this is the first time that a currency has existed in a digital world like this so britain money is different when you just add numbers to a computer screen jt what you think yeah i'll just add that you know he basically described america once again and the deficit spending will continue to get worse and uh you know especially if we stay in somewhat uh restrictive in terms of in terms of monetary policy while not really pumping the brakes that hard on fiscal policy that just builds the debt bomb that we have and the larger the debt grows obviously the larger the deficit itself so it's kind of a self-perpetuating problem and yeah like you said that's kind of the path we're on now in terms of losing our reserve status i don't think that's going to happen in my lifetime uh but this trajectory is one in which you could lose your reserve status probably just simply due to uh the deficit and deficit spending eventually because if not already as we are speaking it is the largest or is going to be the largest expense that we have as a country literally just servicing our debt in general so yeah staying on that path uh, can only be the opposite of fortuitous and be horrible let me know your thoughts on this man i think that stable coins could allow us to kick the can down the road in a healthy way and i mean that i say that because like you know we went through this uh money bag joe said it's gonna be a pandemic phase where we printed all this money and that is a funny name right there i don't know if you made that up that's good <laughs> money bag joe <laughs> say it's gonna be a pandemic so we went through that and uh you know we printed more money in the short time than we did throughout history combined but when you think about a stable coin other countries experience way worse inflation right and we talk about stable coins being the best business model in crypto because like for example when you go buy a usdc or usdt you can go on their website you know they get audited well usdc gets audited every month i believe but you can see what's backing the stable coin and it's mostly like commercial paper treasuries and things like that so the reason why it's the best business model in crypto is because when you buy a stable coin they're essentially giving you a digital dollar they're taking your real dollars they're going to buy short-term treasuries and they're not passing that yield over to the user it would be exactly like you go into a bank you depositing and you're getting a zero percent apy while they're just investing your money so stable coins make they make more than the Ethereum blockchain. Like when I say it's the best business model, mm -hmm. I literally mean it. So when I think about that and I think about these other people in other countries who can't get access or they only have access to their currency and it's fucked. And now they have the option to be able to buy a more stable currency in the US dollar. That's going to cause a demand for US dollars to increase worldwide. And I feel like it can just make the dollar stronger and enable us to kick the can down the road in a more healthy way, like I said. What's your thoughts on that? I think it's if it's used um, as a, like a complementary currency to the dollar, I would agree, which it kind of like, seems like it's going that way. What which, do you mean by complementary? So there's different types of currencies. Obviously, you got your legal tender or your, your main currency. Then you have your complementary currencies. They usually operate 
usually within like a local system or alongside of whatever the legal tender is. And it, there are countless examples of this throughout history, actually. Uh, if you look up Switzerland, I forgot the currency name. It was a complementary currency that they were using in addition to the franc. And uh, it allowed like certain areas in Switzerland to be inoculated from recessionary activity because they were using that complementary currency in circulation in their local communities. And so if it was something like that, if it was more widely adopted as a medium of exchange, you know, maybe so to where it has like constant velocity, I should say, if it's more of, you know, on and off ramp for investing, which actually that's kind of what it is now for the most part. But yeah, we've seen it used for more of a, you know, on and off ramp in terms of getting in and out of the market in a quicker way for the most part that's what we've really seen it used for um so that way people don't have to exit the exchange fully or whatever reason that they want to hold money in stable coins right or maybe they just want to be in the space but they don't want to be in a volatile asset so they'll simply just put it in usdc to say that they're inside they're in the market type deal you know and so if that's the case i can't see it prolonging what was the initial question prolonging our issues like kicking the can down the road right yeah, helping the dollar remain stronger longer. Yeah, no, not sta not just stable coins in general, especially if they remain on the trajectory that they're on now. But the Federal Reserve using principles from stable coins with a CBDC, that's what I think would kick the can down the road even greater. Uh, just because, you know, I've been saying for a long time, in terms of real time data uh, decision making, having a CBDC is like the panacea for the Fed. That's like having true inflation, something like true inflation, but for every aspect of your monetary policy decisions. And so they'd be able to like pivot, make uh, decisions a lot faster. They'll be able to respond versus, uh, versus react, actually, even in that position. And I think that's the only way we'll like really truly kick the can down the road is if they find some way to implement a CBDC way quicker than we've anticipated using like principles from stable coins. Uh, but stable coins themselves, you know, they're more of an off ramp, on ramp slash store value, legit. Maybe they'll become more of a medium of exchange, but it hasn't happened in the way that I thought they would. In like 2017, I remember thinking like, this is going to be the reason people are transacting in Bitcoin. If you have a stable coin built on top of Bitcoin, I was saying it's 2017. Uh, it didn't happen exactly like that, of course. And uh, yeah, now you see that is more so on ramp on ramp store value simple as that so i would agree like just for like a few minute differences i guess yeah no that makes sense and i, I should have clarified more we're kind of on the same page here like i'm not thinking usdc is going to be like the end all be all yeah 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 usdc is like that is like the government stable coin already in my eyes you know yeah. um like jeremy allaire that boy inserted himself and inside of the government, I feel like. He seems like a politician slash executive that's been in Wall Street for 30 years uh, when he speaks. So he's like planting himself there. So they're like <laughs> our government stable coin, 100%. That yeah. if they were to recommend one or use one as a proxy to build the CBDC, they would use USDC, I think. For sure. Especially since Coinbase is like the custodian and they own part of a uh, circle which owns USDC. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next point. That was a good one. Holding debt as an asset that provides interest is typically rewarding early in the long-term debt cycle when there isn't a lot of debt outstanding. But holding debt late in the cycle when there is a lot of debt outstanding and is closer to being defaulted on or devalued is risky relative to the interest rate being given. Well, if it's going to be defaulted on or devalued, that probably implies that the interest rate was rel higher on a relative basis. And so, yeah, I guess, you know, when it comes to holding debt, once again, it, it makes more sense in a low interest rate environment, which is true. Things start to get repriced and the valuations change of different assets as interest rates go up because that's the cost of capital, the cost of money. And in the valuation, sometimes refinance risk are going to be priced in that valuation. And so at some point in time, it becomes aka the commercial real estate market unprofitable to hold such loans uh, because when i initiated this loan or started holding this debt maybe i was borrowing at probably less than one percent for a lot of these big dudes maybe 0.6 percent right and out of nowhere 
I have to, well, not even out of nowhere. It was kind of a slow cook, but I knew it was coming. Now I have to refi and I can't get below even 3%, which isn't crazy at all, but it's just on a relative basis. That's pretty insane because all of our profitability and the valuation that we put on this building was based on my interest rate being 0.6 and overall interest rates being whatever they are, but low. When those interest rates go up, once again, obviously that goes into repricing the real estate. And so now when you have a new buyer, that buyer comes in and say, hey, you bought this when yeah, at a 0.6% rate. I can't assume it. And I also can't go get that rate from a bank. I'm going to pay minimum three and a half percent. So now I have to adjust my price to meet my desired cap rate. And so now to the seller who's selling me that building, he's just going to get paid less. Uh, and really, it's only because of the cost of capital has went up, affecting the profitability of that building. Simple as that. And so that's like a specific example of how holding debt in an early debt cycle. And I guess it depends on what is early in the debt cycle. I'm assuming it's when rates are lower. And so I don't know if he specifies that right there. But yeah, when you buy in a, the beginning of a debt cycle, things are great. Obviously, easy money and it just gets worse over time. We've seen the same thing outside of commercial real estate with Silicon Valley Bank. They basically took customers deposits. They effectively borrowed long and lent short. And so when they bought those treasuries, treasuries, they bought long duration. But when they got customer deposits, obviously that's short term cash. And so those customers can come in and, and take their cash out at any, any point in time. But remember, they bought treasuries with a good chunk of the cash. And so their money is actually locked up until maturity, uh, really. And so when they came in, when the customer started basically asking for their money back, they ran into two issues. Obviously, uh, they needed to let their books mature, their treasuries mature. But even if they did, because now those treasuries were repriced, they were devalued, they were at a lower price, at a higher yield, they would lose. I mean, they lost like billions of dollars like in one day. Um, and that's part of the reason is because those treasuries were now worth less and they had customer deposits or customers coming and taking out their money were drawing pretty much at the same time. And so now you run into, you don't have the money to actually give them because it's still locked up into maturity, but also you have a ton of unrealized losses because your bonds are worth less. And so that's just another example outside of commercial real estate and how buying or, or owning debt early in the debt cycle is way better than later in the debt cycle. That's good stuff. Nothing to add there. I feel like you broke that down pretty good. If I did have to say anything, it's kind of just like the relationships between like bond prices uh, fluctuating with the rise and fall of interest rates. I'll just leave it at that. Let's go on to the next point. This is kind of just like a fact. It says of the roughly 750 currencies that have existed since 1700, only about 20% remain and all of them have been devalued. It's the fun fact. Kind of just touches on what I said earlier on how like people always- Why are we so surprised at that? Like, it's so weird. Like, you know, I feel like shit is made to be devalued. I, even us as a human, like we're literally becoming more decrepit and decrepit as we get older. And so it's like, you know, uh, kind of like, like we become more I feel what you're saying, but now you're just going to go deep. Like you're going to go deep. But when well, we're, if we look at life in a straight line, we know it's not a straight line, but if we look at life in a straight line, it's like even our bodies, it, it becomes devalued. So yes, every currency has been devalued. I can't picture a world where an actual currency goes up forever. That literally doesn't make sense. Uh, money is different. Remember, we make that distinction all the time. But an actual currency is kind of made for that. Like almost like uh, it builds up enough entropy within the system of the velocity of the currency and it just explodes. It implodes on itself. That's what happens with every single currency in history. And Obviously, we know that, but I feel like every time we hear it, we seem surprised or someone acts surprised. And it's like, wait, that's that's kind of what it's supposed to be like, which is why it's important to have money back in the currency. And I think that's even if we don't truly understand this as a collective, inherently we do. And that's why everybody who's like an advocate for Bitcoin, that's why we say we need sound money. Even if they never said what I just said, it's because we know currency is literally made to get to that point, like I said, where it builds up enough entropy and it kind of just destroys itself due to the chaos within the system. So it's like, that's not a surprising feat. And the same thing happens within our body 
at the end of the day as well. And so that's like everything except for no, like a goal. Yeah. Like like literally, like it's it's just very few, like a gold and a Bitcoin probably will eventually be that as well. And those things, they respond to the devaluation of currencies, which are completely natural once again. And I think we figured that out a long time ago in terms of America, which is even why we got off the gold standard. Although it allowed more flexibility to manipulate the money supply, whatever you want to do. It's like we can prolong the life of the US dollar by detaching it from gold. By keeping it attached to gold, the life of that currency is actually shorter. Although it's important to have sound money backing things when you have a society like the US, it probably is. I can't see how it would be beneficial to have hard money in, in America. I'm gonna be real. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you uh if you didn't devalue it, the only way it'll last longer is if the people are poorer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or it's more like localized. But... Yeah. No, that's good stuff. All right, next point. The goal of printing money is to reduce debt burdens. So the most important thing for currencies to devalue against is debt, i.e. increase the amount of money relative to the amount of debt to make it easier for debtors to repay. Debt is a promise to deliver money. So giving more money to those who need it lessens their mortgage. debt. That's an example of a mortgage. I always say a 30-year mortgage is the best inflation hedge. It's also, America's, buy- it's also America's best product. Yeah. And when you buy- for a bank for 30 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that benefits the bank, but also the benefit to the borrower is that when they're done paying off, theoretically, they should be paying in less dollars. So it should be cheaper for them in the long run. So yeah, that's an example of a 30 year mortgage. Yeah, this kind of touches on the other point when he was saying like, um, like the reserve currencies fall in kind of the situation that we're in now. And the reserve currencies fall the slowest because if you're a reserve currency, uh, most of the time, other cur- other countries are holding your debt in the form of treasuries. And if you're printing money, you can pay off your own debt instead of a situation to where currency isn't as like popular or liquid and you have debt denominated in the other currency. So you can't just swap yours for theirs. You're, you actually have to work for it to earn it and then pay it back. And that's a lot harder. So. Yeah, aka Japan, which they're trying to reverse right now, which is why they've been buying less treasuries yep. um, in these auctions. Yep. Good stuff, good stuff. Let's move to the next one. To be successful, the system has to produce prosperity for most people, especially the large middle class. This touches on what I said earlier about America being a large middle class country. As Aristotle conveyed in politics, these states are likely to be well administered in which the middle class is large, and stronger if possible than both the other classes, upper class and lower class. Where the middle class is large, there is no middle class and the poor are excessive in number, troubles arise and the state soon comes to an end. So it it just kind of reminds me of like- Detroit? Returning to the, returning, like how things always return to the mean. If things aren't usually on the mean, then that means it's either two up or two down. Other what's places. considered like what's the income for middle class in America these days? Uh, sixty-five thousand in twenty twenty-one, mm-hmm. and forty-three thousand one hundred and thirty k. This is Investopedia. I think this is like twenty twenty-two or three. Man, that's middle. That's middle class. I'm not surprised. That's actually, bro. That's America's we, middle we, class. We've been living in expensive places lately, bro. What the fuck, bro? I mean, bro, come on, bro. That's not middle class. That's like, bro, that's low as fuck. Bro, there's times I made 38,000 on one transaction and I feel like, oh shit, like I need to make some more, you know? It's like, bro, they make that in a year. And then after you take out taxes and all that, you get all that shit slow as hell over time. Bro, that's poor. I'm sorry. That doesn't, that does not, that doesn't help. It's a lot of places in America where you can live comfortably off that. I sounds about Name right. place. Too. Iowa, fucking Maine. Okay, maybe you're right. Yeah, Not it's, fucking it's, Maine, but Iowa, you're probably right. Yeah, like uh, Central like Iowa. Arkansas, uh, yeah. Armorillo, Texas. That's super out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, not California or New York or nothing like that or Florida. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, not even in here in Arizona. In Arizona used to be affordable. That's what I'm saying. Like we've been living in expensive places since we moved from Michigan. 
All right, let's go to the next. While production, trade, and private ownership had existed before, the ability of large numbers of people to collectively buy ownership and money-making endeavors through public equity markets did not exist. The Dutch created that when they invented the world's first publicly listed company, Dutch East India Company, and the first stock exchange in 1602, Amsterdam Stock Exchange. I forgot the Dutch had like did that, invented capitalism in that way. And I guess before that, people were just like bartering and trading and mystery of capital. We were going to do that book review today, but that book talks about like third world countries are third world countries because they can't prove that they own something. And if you can't prove that you own something, you can't borrow against it. If you can't borrow against it, you can't get that's essentially credit. If you don't have credit, you have a third world country. So that's what I think when I hear that. You got any yeah, thoughts? Like I always like one of the bigger steps in terms of like turning a third world to develop country is property rights. If you have a clear system for property rights, that literally like is the foundation to build everything else on. At least that's yeah. what I think is a good place to start. Because I watch a lot of like uh, those vloggers who like travel and, you know, like Indigo Traveler is the one I watch the most, to be honest. And uh, he goes pretty much into the weeds, you know, with these people. And uh, he talks about their living situations quite a bit. And usually they, they have a landlord, which I also find crazy. And I'm like, man, who the fuck owns that house, actually? Because it's usually like a shed or something. And um, they pay rent. Maybe they never seen the owner. Maybe they want to buy it. Maybe they own it. Somebody just took it from them. Um, but it all stems from not having like a clear system for storing data for property rights. And yeah. uh, they, well, they usually own it illegally. And then they have to pay like cartels and police officers to like basically not get killed. Yeah, because you can essentially just go somewhere in some of these places, throw up like four fucking sheds and then tell these people, like, hey, pay me this. You can live here. Simple as that. You never have to do any maintenance. You don't have to worry about if somebody tries to steal it, you could probably take violent action in some of these places so yeah yeah property rights are the foundation yep all right last point here guys and i'm gonna give you guys my rating and if i recommend who i would recommend read this book the core difference between americans and chinese is that americans hold the individual above all else while the chinese put the family and the collective above everything america is run from the bottom up democracy and optimized for the individual China is run from the top down and optimized for the collective. That's pretty interesting. That's just like talking about like the difference in cultures. You guys are familiar with fractals, which is like self similarities and within a piece, you can look at both economies that way. I think America is a little more muddled these days, but let's take China, for example, you know, from let's start at the state level. Yes, it's top down. The top head, the head makes a decision. Going to a business, the head makes the decision top down 100%. Or go to the family level, top down 100%. The man usually controls the household 100% over there. And probably the same thing in the schools and literally every aspect of their life. Ain't no our, feminism over there either, guys. Yeah, so. our, our, our society over here, although we may get suggestions and pushes by the, the leaders in these spaces, in America, we say, if you guys just go on social media for 10 seconds, you'll see the difference. Like, bro, people say some crazy shit. They'll disagree with you. They will undermine your authority no matter who you are. They're going to troll the shit out of you no matter what. And if you're too rigid in one of your ways and it goes against this way, no matter who you are, they're going to fight you on that. 100%, whether it's through social media or real life, 100%. And they're going to fight until they feel like they've got some type of victory over you i can almost guarantee you in china it's not the same yeah you're going to have some protests you're going to have some rebellion that's in every society but for the most part our culture has instilled such a huge sense of individuality that we all feel like we're the main character in china they probably look at another man like oh he's the fucking main character uh jack ma he's the main character so whatever he says he goes or she he's the main character whatever he says goes us over here, we wake up in the morning like, ah, I'm ready to start my movie. World revolves around me. If it doesn't go my way, I get upset. Simple as that. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely a difference within the culture, but also it's the reason that capitalism has been able to thrive, how it has. Some people say it's it, it's it's hurting. 
But with capitalism, inherently, there's always going to be an ever-growing wealth gap. You cannot do anything about that unless all the rich people just willingly give their money to people who didn't do anything to get it. And uh, yeah, that's not really a good solution. Basically repurposing dollars or redistributing funds just blanketly. I don't think that's a good solution. And so with capitalism, there always comes an ever-growing wealth gap. But with communism, there always comes an ever-decreasing quality of life unless you have like the most benevolent fucking communist dictator of all time. And he's actually a really nice guy, but also an asshole behind closed doors, but he wants the best for you when you're at home. Yeah, guys, I've never read this book, by the way. Yeah, Ever. so I give this book a, not gonna lie, as an American citizen, it's a little nerve wracking reading this book because it was just like, oh man. But I would give it, I give it a solid eight and a half out of 10. It was some good stuff how he broke down uh how he broke down everything so I definitely recommend it it's not i wouldn't recommend it to like a beginner you might want to read a few yeah. advanced books first because it's not i mean unless you want to be looking up shit every page literally <laughs> but yeah ray dalio so he's a he's a big macro guy so it's a really like top down bird's eye view look at how nations rise and fall pretty much that's what the book is called so yeah, just going through the notes, I would agree. Eight and a half. I didn't read it myself, but it seems like it got some uh, great information. And um, yeah, I can always appreciate a book with some good information that lasts forever, guys. And keep in mind the shit you find in books, it's probably an 80% chance you won't be able to find it anywhere else. So, yep. So, with that, guys, we thank you for tuning in. Let us know which book or books you want us to review next. Like, comment, subscribe here at Know It Else, but also to our personal channel. Know It Else is more about principles and macro. Jay Manchin, he talks about the Fed and real estate on his channel. On mine, I talk more about crypto and actual strategies that you can employ. I cover all of the, a lot of the DeFi protocols, yield firming protocols. But with that, I thank you guys for tuning in. We love every single one of you. And we'll see y'all in the next video. Take care.